we would now use the Xworks software to create a complex velocity model. Xworks is basically a software to create digital geological cross sections, but it also has the facility to mark horizons and faults on a seismic image. So this is the startup interface of Xworks software. We load interpreted horizons and faults from a seismic section. We also load the seismic image. So this is the interpreted seismic section. We also load the RMS velocities. So here all the velocity functions have been loaded. We select the layers option and I switch off this seismic image. Here we can see these velocity functions. This is the RMS velocity function and these red dots are the velocity time pairs. Similarly this is the average velocity function and finally this one is the interval velocity function. The software has the provision that when we load the RMS velocities, it computes the interval as well as average velocity functions and displays all of them. But we have the option to switch them on and off. Now I load another copy of the same dataset. Now let's have the two views displayed simultaneously. We screen fix both the datasets so that the whole data is displayed in both the windows. Now we apply spatio-temporal interpolation to the first dataset. We consider a temporal interpolation interval of 200 milliseconds, whereas spatial interval of 2 CDPs. Similarly, we also apply the temporal as well as spatial smoothing operators with 3 points moving average. So here on the right side, we have the spatio-temporal interpolation applied to the datasets. We also apply the same process to the data in the left window. So spatio-temporal interpolation has now been applied to both the datasets. We can select one of these windows and we can zoom them. Let's further zoom this dataset for this part. Here we can see we have closely packed velocity functions after every two CDP and each of these functions has velocity pairs after 200 milliseconds. In this way, we have a two-dimensional grid of velocity field. Similarly, these are our average velocities and these are our interval velocities. We switch back to the dual display. Now in the left-hand window, we apply another process which is called horizon-based velocity interpolation. Since we have already applied the smoothing operators, we don't need to apply them. We simply apply horizon-based interpolation after every two CDPs. So now we can see on the left side, we have a horizon interpolated velocity field. Comparing the two sets of sets, we can see that initially both the data sets are the same. But now on the right hand side, we have applied spatio-temporal interpolation where the velocity functions are in the form of a regular grid and each velocity function has velocity time pairs after every 200 milliseconds. Whereas on the left hand side, as we can see, these red dots are the velocity time pairs and therefore the velocity functions have been interpolated at all the interfaces. Now let's zoom this section. So these are our RMS velocities, these are the average velocities and finally these are the interval velocities. So here we can see within each interval velocity function the intervals are well defined according to the geologic structures. So technically this is a velocity model which is constrained according to the geologic structures that is the velocity field follows the geologic structures. Now we switch back to the dual mode. 
we switch off all the velocity functions and now we apply 2D seismic forward modeling to both the sections. For this we would create a wavelet. So this is a source wavelet that has been generated and now we would convolve this wavelet with the reflectivity series generated from the interval velocity functions and we will get a synthetic seismic trace. Similarly, we will apply the same process to the right side dataset. So now we can see on the right hand side, we have seismic reflectors after every 200 milliseconds and these reflectors do not match with the geologic structures. Whereas on the left hand side, we have reflectors in the synthetic seismic section which closely match with the geologic structures. Thus by definition on the left hand side, we have a true velocity model which more precisely represents the geologic structures because the velocity field has been constrained according to the geologic structures. Thus from this we can see that this 2D forward modeling is a good test for any velocity field. If the velocity field generates geologically realistic features in the synthetic seismic section, then that field is a true velocity model. Okay, now we enlarge this field, we zoom it, we again go to the forward modeling option and generate the wavelet, but this time we also include signal to noise ratio option. So here we can see we have set up the signal to noise ratio to 10. We can reduce the signal to noise ratio, let's say 5. So now we can see more random noise. So in this way we can do various experiments with the signal to noise ratio. Now we remove the synthetic seismic section. Okay, now as we are moving our cursor on this section at the bottom we can see we have the X coordinate in terms of CDP, we have the Y coordinates in terms of time in milliseconds but in addition to that you can see we have the average velocity as well as depth in meters. So it means that the velocity model has been computed in the background and now as we move across this cross section at every point we have the time value, we have the depth value as well as the velocity value. Another option available in the software is that it has an integrated time depth facility. If I move the mouse on this top bar and click the left mouse button, so I also get a depth bar. So this annotation is basically the time, whereas on this gray bar we have the depth. And this is movable and you can see that when we move this bar, depth values are changing. This is because of the fact that velocity varies laterally and therefore the time to depth conversion would be different at different locations because of the variation in velocity. This software also has a good feature. If I click the mouse button along with the shift key, I get this dialog. Here at this point, the software generates a table of formation tops along with their times, average velocities as well as depths. And I can interactively select any location and it would give a table for that location. So this is quite useful to get a comparison of velocity, depth as well as time at any location along the cross section. Finally we apply the time to depth conversion and the whole section is instantly converted into a depth section. So now we have a total depth of more than 10,000 meters. As the velocity field is not properly available at this end, so we can see some of these bends, but we can trim them and correct them. So this is the edited depth section. Now we can display the nodes and using the object information option, we can display the length of each of the segments. Similarly, we can also display the dip angle for each of these segments. And finally, we can also display the total length of each of these objects. The software also has the option for computing crustal shortening. Here we can see that the total length of this section is 
24,000 meters, whereas this horizon is 25,729 meters. Thus, there is a crustal shortening of 1,729 meters. Similarly, the crustal shortening has been computed for all the other reflectors. Now, as the velocity field has been computed, we can export the RMS velocity, the average velocity, as well as the interval velocity in time as well as depth domain. And these velocity fields can be further used in other computations such as rock physics, where we can compute the shear component as well as density and other elastic moduli. In addition, this velocity field can also be used to compute our burden pressure, vertical effective stress, pore pressure gradient, as well as fracture gradient to get pre-drill estimates of the pressure regime. So this was all about creating the velocity model. Thank you.